What is up, MSM? It is great to see you. We are going to dive into some announcements here in just a second. But first, I have a question to start off 2022 with you, and it's this. What is one thing that you're looking forward to in 2022? One thing that you're looking forward to in 2022. I know my wife and I are looking forward to going to some uh, Giants games this year. We've got uh, like a few of them bought already, so we are ready for the baseball season to start. But we want to know what you're looking forward to as well. So put it down in the chat below. We've got a ton of stuff for you on the way in 2022. The first of which is going to happen January 11th. We're going to be at CPC for our first ever New Year's Carnival. January 11th at CPC, drop off and pick up can be in the courtyard. And guess what? As you walk up in the courtyard, there's going to be some mini corn dogs. There's going to be some cotton candy, some cookies, some crackers, all sorts of stuff that you'll want to eat. And we ask, though, that you do eat it outside in the courtyard just so that we can continue to wear our masks inside at all times and keep everybody safe. That is going to be quite the time. I hope you're able to make it out. If you want to, we would highly encourage you to go ahead and register with the link uh, below in the video description or any of the emails that we send to you on a weekly basis. Normally those emails go out on Monday afternoon. So you can always dive back into that inbox and check out the link to register because we want to see you at this carnival. It is actually going to be 6.30 to 8 p.m. So it's a little bit different than our regular life group time. So 6.30 to 8 p.m. is gonna be our first ever New Year's carnival at CPC. We can't wait to see you there. But first, we gotta get into what God has for us today. So let's go ahead and pray. We're starting our brand new series called Into the Unknown, and we're gonna look at how God is gonna be with us every step of the way in 2022. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for being with us last year. God, thank you for everything you brought us through and that you brought us to this moment. I ask you to help remind us this year that you are always with us. We are never alone and we are never without help. We ask you for that and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. What is up, MSM? It is great to see you. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sam, and we are in week one of our series called Into the Unknown. We could save the frozen puns for next week, right? We are in week one of our series called Into the Unknown, and here's our question this week. When we're in the unknown, are we all alone? Does God care? Is he with us? What's his role in this? And what should we do when we're in unknown spaces? We're entering into a new year, and there's going to be some unknown things. You might change schools. You might change houses. You might move neighborhoods. You might have some big change happen in your life this year. And we're going to talk about what your place is in all of that. Bree and I went through this last year uh, when we moved from Florida to California. We are so grateful to be here uh, but as we took the trip, we loaded everything up in a, a, like a SUV that we rented, including our two cats. That's right, including our two cats. We had to put them in like little crates, animal carriers. Uh, they were comfortable, but they did not have the room they were used to, obviously. And as we're on our way out here, we had three stops. We stopped in... Uh, Dallas the first night, we stopped in Albuquerque the second night, and then the third night we stopped in Bakersfield. Now the interesting thing about this is that each stop, when our cats would get out into the Airbnb or hotel, wherever we were at, both of them would react the same each night. Each night. Piper, our littler kitten, who's a little more adventurous, she would kind of stick her head out the crate right away as soon as we set her down. She kind of look around, put one paw out. It was as if she just landed on the moon, right? She was all ready to explore, but kind of cautious. And she'd put one paw out, then another paw out, and then she'd bolt out of the cage and want to destroy the place, right? Like, she was that cat. And uh, then Bella, who's our little older, a little more distinguished cat, uh, she would feel most safe in the place that she was just complaining about, right? So she was yelling at us the whole time we were driving, uh, 
expressing how displeased she was while being on that drive confined in a small cage and hitting bumps. Every time we would hit a bump on the road, she would screech out something that sounded a little bit like, like she got so angry at us uh, while we were driving. But when we'd set her down in her room for the night, uh, she would just kind of poke her head out and then go back in. And she'd poke her head out and then go back in. And we'd have to like give her treats to get out of her cage, which was the very place she just complained about and felt trapped in. Now she wouldn't ever want to get out of her cage. And as soon as she did get out, boom, she would bolt into like the nearest bathroom or underneath a couch or underneath a bed. And she would stay there the whole time. Like, this is terrible, I'm scared. And she would sit there and hide the whole entire time. It took them days to get used to, well, it took Bella days to get used to our, our house in California. We lived in Burlingame at the time and it took her probably about a week until she felt comfortable in her new environment. Normally, we respond to change a lot like either Piper or Bella. Maybe y'all are a little bit like that. You respond a little bit more like Piper, like you see a new school and you're like, <gasps> New friends, you see a new team and you're like, I bet I'll make the team. Or you see a vacation and you only see the fun stuff, right? And you're like, this is so great. I'm gonna get to go to Disney or I'm gonna get to go skiing or something like that. And you're only thinking of the good stuff. You're adventurous by nature. How many of y'all are like that? That's me sometimes, sometimes. Or maybe it's like, it's not a vacation thing. Maybe it's that a guy or a girl tells you that they like the way that you look or they like you and it makes you feel really special and you're like, I don't know what to do with that, but it's really exciting. But maybe change doesn't affect you that way. Maybe change affects you a little bit more like Bella, right? You're a little bit more skittish. You're a little bit more scared of change. That's okay. It's a little bit more like me. Maybe you go into a school and you don't think of all the friends you might make. You think of all the people you don't know. Maybe you think when you join a new team, you're like, great, now I've got new coaches who don't know me. This is gonna be really difficult. Or you see yourself change and you don't like what you see in the mirror. And you're like, I don't know what's going on, but I don't like it. Or even entering into a new school or a new grade, you start to get overwhelmed by homework and you don't think every day, oh, I can't wait to go learn, but rather you sit in your seat at class or across a camera on Zoom and think, this is really difficult. Like this is not the way it was back then. This is really hard. I don't know why I'm having to be here. This class is ridiculous. This teacher is really hard to understand. I don't like this. This is nasty. Normally we have two different reactions to change and some of us fit into those categories, but maybe some of you can identify with both of them. I'm kind of in both categories as well, so don't feel bad about that. But here's the big question that we're gonna to tackle today. When we're in the unknown, are we all alone? Are we all alone in that unknown? The nation of Israel was actually experiencing a lot of change uh, when Moses and Aaron led them out of slavery from Egypt. They were captive in Egypt, Horrible situation had happened. They were slaved, or enslaved by Egypt, which is absolutely horrible. It should never happen to anybody, but it happened to them. And so God saw that. He acted. He did something about it. He sent Moses and Aaron to deliver them away from Egypt and away from their slavery. So Moses and Aaron do that in a wild story. If you haven't read it yet, you gotta read it. The Bible is awesome. It's got a whole thing in there. We win at the end. It's a good book. You gotta read it. Um, I'm just messing around. But seriously, go read the story of them getting out of Egypt. It's fantastic. Uh, so as that happens, then a bunch of new trials and tribulations and craziness starts to happen, right? So as soon as they get out of Egypt, Egypt starts chasing them with like modern day tanks, right? It was like uh, chariots and horses back then, but those were big deals back then. So they start chasing them and then they get to the Red Sea which is a big body of water, right? And they're like, well, our backs are against the Red Sea. We can't do anything. And God splits the Red Sea apart 
so that they can walk through on dry land. That's ridiculous. Like a miracle happens right in the middle of their unknown. Boom, they get to walk through on dry land. It swallows up the Egyptian army. They're safe now from Egypt. That's crazy. That's absolutely wild to think of. Then they get led by uh, like how they're supposed to go. They get led by a pillar of fire at night. So it says, hey, you're in the right place. And then a big cloud during the day. They didn't even need GPS. God was providing for them in miraculous ways. When they were out in the wilderness, their clothes didn't wear out. Imagine having like Air Maxes, right? That never got scuffed. How sick would that be? So they're out there experiencing like miracle after miracle after miracle. And finally, there's a little peace. How many of y'all have ever had like a really busy day before and then you stop and you realize how hungry you are? Yeah, that's exactly what happened to them. After all of this stuff happens, they're so like overwhelmed with change and then boom, they get to take a breath. And what happens? They're hungry. And actually, they're kind of hangry. Y'all ever been there before when you're hangry? I'm going to let y'all type it in the chat. I'm going to take a little, little sip of my drink, and then we'll keep on going. So we see the nation of Israel running away from Egypt. They get out, get through the Red Sea. They get to the portion where they finally get to take a breath. And what do they do? They start to complain, and they start to grumble. They start to get angry at God because God hasn't given us food yet. God just did like 10 miracles to save yourself or to save you guys. But now we're going to grumble about food. Before we start to judge them, though, let's realize that we're pretty messy when we get hangry, too. So let's read Exodus chapter 16, verse 3. We're going to get to see if Israel was all alone in their unknown and how God deals with with people when they're in the unknown, because that's going to reveal our answer today as well, if we're all alone in our unknown. Exodus chapter 16, verse 3, here we go. This is what the nation of Israel said to God. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt. That's a little dramatic. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around filled pots of meat. In other words, like, KFC chicken buckets, right? Um, All you can eat food, which was not true. They were totally misremembering that. They did not get like fair and equitable treatment in Egypt. Pots filled with meat and ate the bread all we wanted. But now you have brought us into this wilderness to starve us all to death. Whoa. Whoa. Sounds like they need a hug. Sounds like they need a hug. And what does God do in this? When he gets a complaint from somebody who's kind of throwing a fit, who's not being nice, who's not being kind, not, they're not like raising their hand to say, hey, I just wanted to say thank you, God, for like delivering me out of this horrible scenario and getting me through all of that, doing miracles for me and, and all of that. No, they're like, hey, I'm hungry and you should have let us sit there in our misery. What does God do? Let's find out. Exodus chapter 16, verse 4. Here it is. Then the Lord said to Moses, Look, I'm going to rain down food from heaven for you. Each day the people can go out and pick up as much food as they need for that day. I will test them in this way to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. So Moses told them this. Hey, God's going to rain down food from heaven. He heard your complaint. Uh... We're gonna, he's going to do something about it. First of all, that's crazy. God didn't even ask them to ask nicely. But he heard the complaint and he said, yeah, you need some food. So I'm going to rain down food from heaven. It was called manna, which is Hebrew for what is it? It was like a flaky bread-like substance. He also flew quail in so that they could have their meat that they wanted as well. So all of a sudden they go from no food to more food that they, that they can actually handle. Now, the instructions were to only take as much as you needed for that day. 
only enough for that day. This was a way for them to um, depend on God each day. This was not God being like stingy, like, oh, I'm not going to give them enough for tomorrow. This was God saying, hey, listen, I'm going to do something that helps you depend on me each day. I'm going to meet your need, but I'm also going to meet your deepest, deeper need, which is a relationship with me. See, God never just meets the need on the surface level without meeting our deepest need, which is for a, a relationship with him. That's what's beautiful about God. Sure, he fixes stuff but he's faithful to fix hearts too. Exodus chapter 16, 19. Moses told them, do not keep any until morning. But some of them didn't listen and kept some until morning. By then it was full of maggots and had a terrible smell. But here's the wild part. God kept working with them. God didn't abandon them. God didn't say, you know what? You're, you're just a bunch of complainers. I'm done with you. You've always got a complaint. You've always got something to say. You're never listening. You know what? I'm going to go find some people that really love me. I'm going to go find some people that will listen to me. That's most of the time what you and I do, right? Most of the time, that's our patience with people. Like, I've, I'm that way with my cats. Like, sometimes I get frustrated with them. I'm like, you're not listening to me. Why couldn't we got a dog, right? Like, <laughs> because cats are cute, that's why. But that's normally our patient span. That's normally the way we respond to things, but not God. He knew they were all alone in the unknown, and he said, you know what? I'm going to show up, and I'm going to provide for them. I'm not just going to meet their physical need for food, but I'm also going to lead them into a deeper and more satisfying understanding of who I am and how much I love them. God's not cheap. He's not just going to meet the physical need. He's also going to meet the emotional and the spiritual need as well. Here's what I want us to get out of this. When change feels like it's way too much and we mess up with it, we're not alone in the unknown. We're not. They weren't alone in the unknown. God was gracious in dealing with them. He was kind. He was patient. God's going to be the same way for us. Our father isn't fragile. He's faithful. Our father is not fragile. He's not going to get his feelings hurt and, and like dip out on us because we've got a, a, a complaint. Now, he will lead us into a deeper understanding of who he is, thankfully. He's going to try to mature us. That's our goal here at CPC MSM, right, is to make and mature followers of Christ. That's what he was doing by providing for them daily. He was saying, hey, I'm going to teach you and train you how to trust me each and every single day for everything. You don't have to go to anybody else but me. I'm going to take care of it all for you. And from that, you'll understand how much I love you. And they misremembered Egypt. They did. They forgot how bad they had it in Egypt. Egypt. They looked back at it and thought, man, God brought me to a worse place. And they got impatient, which I feel like we've been kind of harsh towards um, the people of Israel when we look back at this, because you and I are the same way. We really are. Like when we go into a new school, Sometimes we look at it and go, great, God, I don't know why you brought me here because nobody wants to sit with me at lunch or the teachers are really harsh or the classwork is really difficult. God, I don't know why you brought me to this new team because the coaches are difficult to get along with or my parents are putting more pressure on me and more stress on me because they want me to start. Now I've got three sports that I'm in. I don't know what to do. School's getting harder. Things are piling up on us. God, I feel like you made a mistake bringing me here. Maybe some of us even struggle with what it's like to be in our own body. And we're like, you know what? I don't, God, I feel like you made mistakes. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to verbalize that. I don't know what to feel. Maybe you and your family have a hard time getting along. And you're like, this is really tough. God, I don't know why you brought me here. Why didn't you just let me stay in that old neighborhood? Why didn't you just let me stay in fifth grade? Why didn't you just let me stay in seventh grade at that school with that team, with that coaches, with that group of friends? God, why didn't you let me stay there? And it's because this. Every day he's going to invite you into 
a deeper and better relationship with him. And he's also going to need meet those physical needs. God cares about your physical needs. He does. He cares that you have food and clothes and water, and he cares about all that stuff. But he also cares most and deepest for your soul, for who you are, your person. And during times when we're all alone, we can lose sight of that sometimes, just like the people of Israel did. We can lose sight of the fact that God doesn't just care about meeting our physical needs, making sure we have friends, but he's also going to help us understand how much he loves us and how much he cares about us. God deals with us in a very, very similar way uh, to the way he would with Israel. And here's the thing that I want us to remember as well. When we're in the unknown, we're going to cry out to something. We're going to reach out for something to hold on to. We're going to try and brace ourselves. We're going to try and hang on to something. The question becomes, is this something reliable? Is this thing that I'm calling out to able to meet my needs? Is this person that I'm calling out to, this truth that I think that my friend told me, is this able to support me? Or is it going to leave me broken? Is it going to leave me ashamed? Is it going to leave me hurt? Is it going to leave me alone in my unknown? That's the question. We're going to call out when we're in the unknown. Israel got it right. They did. They called out to God Almighty, the only one that could actually fix the stuff they were going through. The only one that could actually do something about the situation they were in. They called out to God. They deserve to be commended to that. They didn't call out to anybody else. Sure, they had a bad attitude. But at least they directed their complaint to the right person. And God was faithful. He wasn't fragile. So here's what I want us to do. We'll get to application in a second. First, I want to tell you all a little story. We just had some friends uh, come to see us from San Diego, and we love them so, so dearly. They have, like, the coolest little three-year-old son in the world. Uh, he's, he's awesome. He's just that kid. He's super kind, like, opens doors for you, greets you, tells you he loves you, and, like, gives you big hugs and stuff like that. Like, just a cool kid. And uh, their parents left us in charge of him for, like... 30 minutes while they went to the store while they were visiting us. And they went to the store and gave us strict instructions. Hey, if he wakes up from his nap, don't go in his room. Just let him be there. We'll be home soon. We want to, like, help him understand that he needs to wait for us to come out of his room. We need him to understand it's okay for him to be in his room alone and just rest. So we were under strict instructions. And so what is... He do, he wakes up from his nap about 10 minutes out or uh, 15 minutes uh, after they leave. And that means there's about 15 minutes where he's awake in his room. He's awake in his room. And what does he do right away? He starts crying and he starts talking. What does he say? He starts calling out for his dad. He starts saying, dad, dad. Dad, I'm, I'm awake, Dad. Come get me, Dad. Dad, please come get me. Dad, are you here? Dad, can you come get me? Dad, I'm done with my nap. Dad, I want to go play. Dad, are you here, Dad? That for 15 minutes on repeat. What was he doing? He wasn't saying, hey, I need more food. He wasn't saying, hey, I need more toys. He was not saying, hey, I want um, a college fund. He wasn't doing any of that. He was saying, I'm done with the season I'm in. I'm uncomfortable, and I know you're the only one who can fix it. And I know you love me, so would you come fix this? I want to get out of this room, and I want to go play. That's what was on his mind. I want to get out of here, and I want to go where it's better. I'm done with this. That's what the nation of Israel was saying, and that's my hope for us is that when we get in those scenarios where we look into the mirror and we go, I don't like what's changing about me. I don't feel at home in my own body. When we get in those scenarios where we feel all alone at school and we have no idea who to turn to, 
When we get in those scenarios where our family is tense and there's tension and we don't know how to feel, when we get in those scenarios where schoolwork is piling up and sixth grade is really hard now or eighth grade is hard, we're freaking out because we see high school on the horizon. When we get in those scenarios of this is unknown territory for me, I've never been here, what I want us to remember is that our God is faithful. He's not fragile. He can be trusted with our unknown. And everything else is going to let us down. God's the only one who's meant to carry that weight. God's the only one that's meant to bear up under the weight of those questions that we have. of What do I do when I feel like I don't belong inside my own body? What do I do when I feel like everyone hates me and is against me? What do I do when I feel like school is too much? What do I, where do I go? Who do I turn to? He's the only one who's able to answer those questions. He's the only one who's able to give us answers that actually work in real life. Everybody's got an answer, but he's the only one that's got an answer that'll work for us. And he doesn't just, thank goodness, he doesn't just meet the physical need, but he also meets the need for bringing us into a deeper understanding and a deeper trust with him every single day. Our God's not just a cosmic vending machine. He's a father who loves us and cares about us. And I know that's a completely foreign subject for some of us here because dad is distant or dad is far away or dad is cold. But our heavenly father is not fragile. He's faithful. So next time we're in those scenarios, maybe it's this week, maybe it's this month, maybe it's right now as we're listening to this. Here's what I want us to do. I would ask you to just call out to God. And all that means is prayer, right? You just say, God, I'm confused. Would you help? You can say it just like that. God, I'm confused. Would you help? And then look for it. Lots of times God has wisdom for you in your small group leaders. He has wisdom for you in your parents. He has wisdom for you in your coaches, in your teachers, at your school. He has wisdom for you and he has provision for you. It just doesn't always look the way you think it's going to look. So would you ask him for it and then look for it. The people still had to go out and gather up the manna. It didn't just get delivered directly into their system. They still went out and gathered it, but they did ask for it too. So there's our answer. Are we all alone in the unknown? Absolutely not. When we're in the unknown, what are we supposed to do? We got to ask for it and we got to look for it. And then lastly, we got to thank him for it. We have a God who's for us, who's not against us, who's always with us, who will never leave us and never forsake us. We're never alone and we're never without help in our unknown. Peace.
like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we pray come on you sing that this is what living looks like yeah and this is what freedom sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like
Jesus, our redemption. Jesus, and our redemption, and our salvation is in his blood. Chill. 